And our objective for this session is to discuss key priority challenges and opportunities when it comes to appropriately using new technologies for the 2030 clinical trial enterprise. Um, so I'll just remind everyone um, that our speaker bios are found in the briefing books. I will not go through detailed bios here. Um, if you want to add your thoughts, please do so directly for those on the webcast to our Q&A box, as well as to Slack. Um, so now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Robert Califf, uh, really a man that doesn't need much introduction, uh, particularly when it comes to how we need to envision a new clinical trials enterprise. He's currently the head of clinical policy and strategy at Verily Life Sciences and Google Health. Um, also serves as the co-chair of the Drug Forum and, and former FDA commissioner. So uh, without much further ado, uh, Rob, we're excited to hear from you. Great. Thanks, Esther. And it's great to be here with you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Great. So what I did was to listen in to the uh, first part of the meeting, um, tremendous discussion, and then I made some slides on the fly, so they're not pretty, but um, they represent some responses that I had about the use of technology related to what I heard people saying they hope for in the clinical trials enterprise. I do want to note um, it's great to be back with Jeff Drazen because we uh, have been through this exercise before. In fact, I think it's once a decade for 40 years I've been through this exercise and maybe this time we'll make it happen. I don't know. It's um, We still have a long way to go uh, to get this uh, set of issues right. I also want to congratulate uh, City CTTI, for uh, putting forward a set of proposals just now that um, I think are very much in sync with what I've heard today. And, and again, the issue is how do we implement it? So let's go to the next slide. Um, I listened carefully to Janet and I took some notes and I, I thought it was worth reemphasizing a couple of things that she said. Probably no surprise to anyone. I've spent a lot of time over the years talking with Janet about what the issues are. And recently during um, the sort of wrap up of warp speed as we move into the next phase, um, had a chance to talk about what was behind what she had to say today. And I think, um, I think when we look at the response to the pandemic, uh, almost everyone would agree that vaccine development was a big success, a real triumph of the industry and all the communities that needed to come together to make it happen. But Janet, and I agree with it, um, her view was the clinical trials enterprise was not a success. It was, other than the vaccine trials, it was, uh, with a few exceptions, uh, marked by some characteristics that need our attention. And of course, I think we're all uh, concerned about the um, uh, implementation of the vaccine as another issue, but we're not here to talk about that today. Um, but one of the points Janet made that I think is important as we um, think about how bold we should be and our view of this is her, her comment that um, there are a lot of entities that are comfortable with the status quo. And I think in many ways, this is similar to our health system, where I, I would say almost 100% of people now agree that we need to change it. It's not working very well. Our uh, survival in the United States is in reverse for quite a while now on average and precipitously in reverse with the pandemic. But it's hard for anyone to change because all entities are sort of doing okay if you looked at it from just a business and financial perspective and didn't look at the goal of um, improving um, function and longevity for the population. And here, if the goal is to answer the questions that are critical so that we deliver better healthcare, we make, give the right treatments to the right people at the right time. Um, I agree with Janet that we failed right now. Go to the next slide. Um, she also said academic networks are not the answer. And I, being a long time academic, um, I have sort of several reactions to this. Um, and, and I would certainly agree that um, a plethora of committees and competition for who gets the name on the paper and who's the chair of which group um, takes up an inordinate amount of time um, in the academic clinical trial enterprise. But I think part two for her really is a key story, which is that um, 
in order to enroll people in clinical trials at the rate that we need to get the answers that we need at the cost that we can afford, we need this to be something that happens out in the community. And, you know, I'm well aware that academic health systems now are not just ivory towers. They all have enormous uh, primary care practices spread all over the country. So it's not just a matter of uh, community versus academic. I think it's more, are we providing the incentives and the tools? And I heard several people talk about this um, in session number two. Um, next slide. Um, and then she said, well, you know, what are we gonna do? Um, we ought to practice with common chronic disease and I sure agree with that. And she didn't say it should be government run. She said it should be government supported. And um, I would argue as we look now at the technology part of this, um, there's some pretty major questions that she's raised that I hope uh, the forum will address as it goes through this, uh, this exercise. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, this is a slide I borrowed from Steve Steinhubel, who uh, has been a leader in digital uh, health about industries and what happens when digital transformation finally occurs. And what I didn't know when Steve first showed this slide was that he was a chemist at Kodak, actually, when the patents were initially filed by Kodak on digital film uh, photography. But um, he was a chemical engineer and they were doing such a great job of making money with chemical processing of film, they could not bring themselves um, to act on the patents that they had. And so this is a slide that sort of tells the story of various industries. It's sort of interesting that the banking industry is the one group that really handled it well. But to be a bit provocative, I would say the clinical trials industry like fee-for-service healthcare and the pharmaceutical industry is right at the point now where digital transformation is gonna have an impact. And the way people handle it will determine uh, the winners and the losers as things shake out. Next slide. All right, so these are the uh, key concepts. I'll go through each of them uh, quickly. I won't dwell on this particular slide, but um, it's a little disheveled because I was working on this on the fly, but um, at least I enjoy doing it. I hope it uh, will turn out to be useful for people. Next slide. But before we get to the key technical issues, I think there are, th there are three, at least three really, really major non-technical issues that need to be taken into account. And I forgot to mention on the first slide, the title I was given was new technologies. I don't think there are that many new technologies. What we have is an industry that's a few years behind a lot of other industries and in adapting to technologies that already exist. But we're not going to use the technology to its full extent until we come to terms with a new set point on privacy and confidentiality. And um, I'm not here to say what that should be. I'm just saying that our views of privacy and confidentiality are leading to all sorts of lack of fluency of data that would tremendously be uh, good for people's health if the data could move at the right rate. And you know how to govern that, I think, is a major issue. The second one that's come up in the discussion, I think in both groups is prioritization. Who calls the shots? Um, Janet um, clearly thinks that warp speed was a success because essentially the government seized control of a lot of the prioritization and then worked with the stakeholders for sure, but no one questioned what the priorities were. Whereas in the therapeutic area we had, as she pointed out, and she didn't get to go into this, but I'll just say it, when the FDA looked at each arm of each trial in clinicaltrials.gov, only 5% of the arms, at least in the view of the FDA, had any possibility of showing a clinically meaningful result. So one out of 20, um, I think is not the rate that we want. And then the third big area is um, th this really daunting issue that keeps coming up. And it's the question of, uh, because of historical misdeeds, um, there's an understandable system in place to protect people in the setting of clinical research. But it's also increasingly evident that the sharing of information, the participation in research is an opportunity. And so this balance of protection versus opportunity is something that we're going to have to come to grips with, especially um, uh, if we do what many people advocated today, which is move into the community and give more control um, to people, we can't have 
central organizations telling, uh, uh, taking a view that paternalistic protection is the right approach. And I think all three of these issues are interrelated. Um, I hope we'll grapple with them over the course of the meeting of this group. Next slide. So this is just meant to depict, um, you know, a core fundamental issue that came up uh, in everybody's view. Digital uh, has been discussed, I think, in each of the sessions. Um, digital technology can either uh, be a, a rising tide that raises all boats if we make it equitable and distributed and uh, pay attention to the impact of algorithms, et cetera, or it can be used much like it is now in most of our health systems, I would argue, to segment populations to optimize the situation for some people, particularly those who are already digitally enabled and able to uh, manage the system. And I'm sure uh, most of you who have parents or, or my age um, or above experience the difficulty with just dealing with the CDC website, for example, um, to get access to vaccination or the many state websites. So, um, you know, if we don't solve the equity problem, we're not going to accomplish what uh, we could with digitization. Next slide. All right, now. Um, the seven uh, key things that at least I think are in play. First, uh, replace human labor with automation. And um, I just think there's so many manual processes and clinical trials that are very amenable to automation, but we're stuck in a regime where people are afraid to move forward because of concerns about regulatory oversight and um, uh, the risks that's involved there. So we have to move into a regulatory regime that supports and doesn't inhibit automation. Um, we already know now that all the regulation that was stopping virtual visits could have been done a lot better because when we had to do them, we did them. And guess what? They work a good bit of the time. And we also have known a long time that statistical process control is a, and quality by design should be employed. And the city uh, group, of course, has led the way in arguing for that. I think a critical point here is that we're not talking about losing jobs overall because the need for human interaction is so profound in the clinical research enterprise. If we got rid of mundane repetitive tasks that are not adding anything and put those people to work interacting with research participants, we'd be a lot better off in my view. Next slide. Uh, digital support to make work easier and more fun. Uh, gamification, people love it. Um, uh, you know, at any level, you can devise games that make it more fun for people to participate. Um, and also uh, decision support for trials and clinical practice so that people can function at the top of their license. A lot of the reason we don't delegate down in our activities in healthcare is the risk involved, but with the right digital support and the ability to escalate through a virtual visit, there's a great opportunity to use the talents of people at a lower level of education and a lower cost who can have quite valuable jobs. Virtual visits are headed that direction. Um, uh, much like with healthcare, home health workers are gonna, gonna be much more prevalent. Also, uh, clinical trialists who go to the home uh, will be very much liked by many of the participants. And we can now use digital phenotypes to figure out what the right match is for the right person. Um, obviously, what works for me may not work for a lot of other uh, people, and knowing that ahead of time uh, um, enables a digital technology to be successful. And then finally, this was brought up by several people in the discussion in the first two sessions. Anything that can be measured passively should be done that way, as long as it's done with full knowledge and permission, uh, consent of the person that's involved. Because when people have to think about what they're doing, stop and do it, there's an immediate drop off in um, access of data, which is one of the reasons that we call people in for in-person visits. Next slide. Um, if we employ digital technology, we can scale the research to meet these needs that we clearly heard in the first two sessions, representative, reliable, and having adequate power. Um, for the common chronic diseases, there are literally millions of people who are eligible that never get a chance to participate because they may have to drive three hours to get to a research center. Um, if we can move to a more digital system, we should be able to include them. And for rare diseases, it's obvious that there are many more people with rare disease than we usually think. It's just that um, 
we don't have a way of bringing them together across health systems. And our dependence on manual processes really limits this um, opportunity. Next slide. Um, we need to involve uh, patients and participants directly. Um, I think this was covered a lot in the previous two discussions. I won't dwell on this slide other than to say, if you can go directly to somebody and not just go through patient advocates who have a valuable role to play, but um, nothing better than having direct interaction with people to understand what their concerns are and what they need. Um, the technology is here to do it. We just have to figure out what the right rules of the game should be um, to make it possible to do it. And a real opportunity to use self-report to sharpen the depth and comprehension of measures. Like, I'd much rather know uh, what somebody's mobile activity is 24 by 7 than have them come in every six months for a six-minute walk test and try to figure out what it means. Next slide. We need to create communities of learning and research uh, together. Um, one uh, thing about this uh, clinical research enterprise is that it's a balanced system of multiple interests, some more dominant over others traditionally. That's changing as we've discussed, but we don't have technology organized right now to facilitate interaction. If anything, most of the technology is organized in a way that um, separates groups from each other because of the old uh, uh, legitimate concerns about um, data, uh, privacy and uh, keeping the integrity of the data. But um, there are parts of this that clearly can be made into a community now. Uh, um, the social media have figured out how to do it. We just have to figure out how to do it in the clinical research enterprise. Next slide. And Rob, we maybe just have a couple minutes to wrap up. Yeah, but um, um, all right very good stuff. Here. Uh, people have talked about integrating research and practice, um, and um, we all have EHRs and claims data now. This is moving quickly. I'm actually um, enthusiastic that we're going to crack the case here uh, pretty soon with the learning health system theory. Next slide. And then finally, the use of the cloud. And I use cloud in uh, parentheses because it really is just, I'm using it as a term to describe uh, the ability to move data um, through federation, to bring uh, the questions to the data, uh, to optimize uh, both the collection of data and uh, the storage and curation, and to make it available on a global basis. Um, there, there's no doubt the technology is uh, here now to do it. And again, it's a matter of the rules of the road. Next slide. So these are the key concepts again. Next slide. Um, and, and I'll finish with this one. Um, I think we all realize that if our real goal is to uh, advance prevention, uh, diagnosis, and therapy, um, we're going to be much better off if we create um, global data sets that are available with the proper protections to a variety of people to try to understand uh, what the data mean and to participate in the research in a direct way. And so, um, again, I don't agree this is new technology. This is now not new technology, but it's something that our industry uh, needs to adapt to. Thanks uh, for giving me the chance to talk.